Good morning and welcome to the 30th meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2020. I welcome Liam Kerr, MSP, who is joining us remotely for Agenda Item 2. Before I begin, can I please remind members, witnesses and staff present that social distancing measures are in place in committee rooms and across the Holyrood campus. In addition, a face covering must be worn when moving around, exiting and entering the committee room, although they can be removed once you are seated at the table in the room. Can I also remind everyone here present to please turn off any mobile devices to silence so that they don't disturb the committee's work this morning. Agenda item one is decision on taking business in private. Do any members object to taking items three, four and five in private this morning? OK, thank you. That's agreed. Agenda item two is the section 22 report on the 2019-20 audit of the Scottish Police Authority. I'd like to welcome our witnesses this morning, Stephen Boyle, Auditor General for Scotland, who is appearing in person here in Holyrood, Gillian Woolman, Audit Director, and Pauline Gillan, Senior Audit Manager, Audit Services of Audit Scotland, and they are both appearing remotely. I understand that the Auditor General has a brief opening statement. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, members. I am presenting this report on the 2019-20 audit of the Scottish Police Authority under Section 22 of the Public Finance and Accountability Scotland Act 2000. This is the seventh consecutive report prepared by the Auditor General for Scotland following an annual audit of the Scottish Police Authority. The appointed auditor has given an, an unqualified opinion on the annual report and accounts. Despite the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, the annual accounts were signed off by the original planned deadline of 30th September, which is an indication of the continued progress of the SPA's financial management arrangements. Over the past year, there has been greater stability in the leadership of both Police Scotland and the SPA, albeit with interim appointments for both the SPA Chief Executive and Chair. The SPA has begun to make progress in developing the capacity of its corporate function. The governance and accountability of policing remains subject to much discussion. I welcome recent developments, including a revised governance and accountability framework between the Scottish Government and the SPA and the development of corporate plans. Progress is also being made towards implementing the recommendations of the Chief Inspector of Constabulary's 2019 thematic inspection of the SPA. Discussions around governance and accountability of policing are also ongoing between the Cabinet Secretary and stakeholders. Upon completion of these steps, I will decide on whether to undertake any further additional audit work on policing governance as I finalise my forward work programme in 2021. Convener, as planned, the SPA did not achieve financial balance in 2019-20. And as in previous financial years, it has had to secure additional funding from the Scottish Government to support its cash flow requirements. Policing in Scotland is not yet financially sustainable. A revised medium term financial plan is now expected in early 2021, along with the awaited workforce strategy. These outputs are essential to enable the police, its funders in government and those charged with scrutiny to make informed decisions about a future financially sustainable policing model. Without this, it will be difficult for both the SPA and Police Scotland to achieve the plan set out in the Joint Strategy for Policing. Convener, I'm joined by my colleagues Gillian Roman, the appointed auditor of the Scottish Police Authority, and Pauline Gillan. And between us, we'll do our best to answer the committee's questions this morning. Thank you very much, Auditor General. I invite Bill Bowman to open questioning for the committee. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. If I could ask a couple of questions around the financial statements. You, you, you say in your Section 22 report, I think at paragraph 4, that there was an emphasis of matter paragraph included in the um, auditor's report due to the greater uncertainty in property values highlighted by the valuer due to COVID. So we note that the opinion was not modified or qualified in old parlance, but can you explain the impact COVID has had on the uncertainty on the values of the property? Thank you. Good morning. Um, I'm going to um, quickly hand to Gillian Woolman uh, as the appointed auditor to set out the, the judgments that she's made uh, in both the audit opinion and in a little bit more detail about what property values have meant to the judgments that we've reached. Thank you, Auditor General, and good morning to the committee members. 
Yes, an emphasis of matter paragraph has indeed been included in the independent auditor's report on the 1920 accounts. I think you'll find that many public sector bodies have an emphasis of matter paragraph this year relating to the valuation of land and buildings. Uh, Rick's guidance was issued at a UK level to assist valuers in their exercises this year. And valuers have said that there's more uncertainty this year than is normally the case about the values that they have ascribed to that land and buildings. So um, you'll find for, for whatever public sector body or indeed private sector body, where land and buildings is material to the balance sheet, uh, the, there's most likely an emphasis of matter power. Okay, we'll just see if we can get Gillian Willman's connection back up. It seems to have dropped. We'll just give her. Fair view. Let, let, oh, no. I let's that's helpful. Gillian Willman, sorry, your connection dropped there. Can can you take us through that again, please? Yeah, so that's. I'm so sorry about that. No, Not I don't know if it was end. your end or our end, but I'll let you start again. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, so with respect to paragraph four of the statutory re report in front of you, an emphasis of matter paragraph has been um, put in many audit certificates this year. So wherever land and buildings is a significant element of a balance sheet at the end of March 2020, there's often yeah. an emphasis of matter paragraph. So Rick's guidance came out at a UK level and valuers used this guidance to reach their conclusions about values and they are saying that because of the pandemic there is more uncertainty than is normally the case about the values ascribed to these assets um, and during the accounts preparation uh, disclosure was made to that regard by the finance officers and we have then mirrored this fact in our opinion uh, but it doesn't affect the overall opinion that the accounts give a true and fair view Thank you. So I suppose my question then is, does this have an impact on the funding requirements of the body? This is where it will be very important in terms of the financial planning to determine whether any um, forecast capital receipts might have to be revisited. So this is an area that will have to be considered as the future financial planning gets underway. And do we know if um, there are forecast capital receipts of any materiality? Capital receipts do tend to play an important role in the capital plans of most public sector bodies. Uh, we know that finance officers are active on their five-year plan at the moment, and they will be having to update all of their assumptions in that regard in light of this, this new challenge with respect to the values of land and buildings. So there may be a future implication? Indeed. Okay. Can I take you to another point then? Um, you say that the SPA had a total overspend of 26.6 million and the Scottish Government has agreed to provide additional cash of 32.9 million to enable the SPA to meet its cash flow requirements. Can you expand on the difference between the overspend and the cash being made available? Yes, so I can bring you up today just at a high level, um, just as you, one would imagine, it was strictly to do with the cash flow requirements at any point in time. So it would be a timing difference that gives rise to the, the difference between the ultimate cash flow requirement and the funding difference. Um, so it was just to tide them over just in terms of how the cash flow was, was flowing at that time. Um, we can get further detail if you would require about the, the difference there. I'm going to bring in the Auditor we were General. We satisfied. Thank you, Gillian Willman. I'm going to bring in the Auditor General on that point. Thank you, Kavina. Gillian Willman is correct. It is largely a timing difference um, between the, um, the year-end reporting on the 31st of March and then the comparison of the budget. And I've maybe just, um, just amplified Gillian Willman's point to your earlier question, Mr Bowman, in terms of the, the longer-term uncertainty that exists um, around properties and property valuation. <clears throat> the, um, many of the police staff in Police Scotland are members of the Local Government Pension Scheme. There are extensive disclosures um, in the financial statements uh, in terms of pensions. Uh, for the Local Government Pension Scheme in particular, which is um, an asset-backed pension scheme, 
many of the investments will be on in commercial property and, and assets and so forth. That uncertainty will, in, in due course, potentially feed through to some of the financial implications that not just the SPA uh, for its own employer contributions, but really all of the employer organisations um, that are members of those schemes. So I think, as we've captured, and as Gillian has captured in our audit opinion, it mirrors the emphasis of, uh, it mirrors rather the disclosures that the SPA has made in its own accounts, capturing that uncertainty. A lot more uncertainty around. Can, can I just go back then to my other point then? This um, cash injection of 32 million versus an overspend of 26. We're not just, um, well, let's use the word, hiding, um, you know, a bigger overspend here. No, I'm content that this is a this is a timing difference, um, and indeed this is this is not unusual to this financial year either. I think what we've seen in in previous financial years where the SPA has um, overspent its budgets, that the amounts that they have received that, that has exceeded the budget have been largely but not exactly the same as the additional cash flow requirements that it's received, and that then is um, adjusted for in the, the subsequent financial year. But the, point, the wider point you're making, and we, we looked to capture in the report, is that there is inherent lack of stability uh, in the financial position that Police Scotland, the SPA, is continuing to overspend against its budget allocations. And one of the, the key planks that we make in the report is there's now a need for that, uh, a, a single view on what the financial sustainability of policing in Scotland now looks like. Okay. Colin Beattie. Thank you, Convener. Um, just to continue to discuss this uh, this issue around uh, the deficit, Auditor General, your report indicates that our officer numbers are now at the highest level since the introduction of Police Scotland in 2013. Well, at the same time, any of the financial scenarios we've seen projecting uh, the financial position for Police Scotland indicate that this deficit will increase unless action is taken to either cut costs or increase funding. Now, the Section 22 report says that the current mo model of policing in Scotland is not financially sustainable, and it's now a matter of urgency for everyone to get together and reach agreement on what arguments actually, what action actually is actually going to be taken. But I mean, this has come up before. I mean, I've sat here for several years now, listening to the same problems and it doesn't seem to be coming to a resolution. This budget problem is not new. It's just a repeat every, every, every year we get a Section 22, and I think this is the seventh Section 22 on this, but we don't have a resolution. So do the parties involved, and that's the Scottish Government, the SPA and Police Scotland, understand that this is an urgent issue? Do they have a plan? points in there, Mr Beattie, and I'll, I'll try and cover um, all of them. 85% um, of the, the costs captured in these sets of accounts uh, relate to staffing costs. The, the model of um, or some of the, or rather the, the financial savings that SPA Police Scotland have made in previous years have tended to focus on their non-pay costs. So the 85% of staffing costs are now captured in the budget is a higher ratio than other uh, police services um, across the UK. There are a number of reasons behind that, but I think what's tended to happen is that the organisation has reduced um, other parts of its budget rather than policing costs. The, one of the kind of connected, I guess the, the longer term trajectory where that leads me to in some of the analysis that um, Police Scotland's Chief Financial Officer has undertaken in, in uh, recent weeks suggests that without an intervention of kinds around financial sustainability, that its deficit could grow uh, to up to <coughs> 200 million pounds over the next few years. Clearly, you know that the level of sustainability um, is would be reducing further without some kind of step change. And the two scenarios that SPA have previously outlined in that regard are that they receive significant increases in their base budget or that they reduce uh, officer numbers. The latter of those two points, though, um, is dependent upon a workforce strategy. 
And we've heard the, um, in, in some of the responses to, to this report confirmation that um, the strategic workforce strategy will be brought to the SPA um, in January for its consideration. Um, we had expected that to be delivered earlier during the course of, of 2020. Clearly, there's mitigation in the, in the, that the pandemic overtook you know, of, um, progress in this area. But it marks a very significant and important milestone that the SPA and those charged with scrutiny can have a rounded picture, a rounded analysis for their scrutiny, that it's not just based upon a premise of either cutting um, police numbers or increasing the budget. It's a wider consideration of scenarios that looks at the ratio of police officers to police staff. All of these things matter. So I think you're quite right that this is not a new scenario and that there has, this has been many years in the making. Um, I would have been confident that progress would have been made and, and reported publicly had it not been for the pandemic. But it's clear that, you know, as we've said many times, that this is a really urgent matter to get us to now a, a position that sets out how policing can be made sustainable in years ahead. That uh, one part you didn't answer there is, are you satisfied that all the parties involved, in, and I'll repeat it, it's uh, SPA, Police Scotland and Scottish Government, do they understand the urgency in this? And if they do understand the urgency, why hasn't something been done before? So, um, um, it's probably difficult for me to convey with conviction that they understand the urgency. My understanding and expectation is that, the, that this is well understood and appreciated. And indeed, I, I note the Chief Constable's comments about the importance of a workforce strategy and his commitment that this will be brought to uh, the SP in January for its consideration before uh, it then uh, moves to the Scottish Government for its approval. But nonetheless, and I think there is it's genuine mitigation, Mr Beattie, that had it not been for the, the pandemic, we would have been further forward in this area. But nonetheless, I think with the, all of the upheaval that the committee has heard of policing uh, in years, this is only recent signs of progress. And next, early next year is a key milestone upon which we'll be able to judge whether that progress will be translated into a, an effective, coherent workforce plan that links to a, a coherent financial strategy of, for policing into the future. Now, in the past, the committee's scrutiny of uh, SPA, the committee's questioned whether SPA actually has an adequate level of control over the budget because it's entirely reliant on operational decisions of Police Scotland. Does the model actually work the way it's been set up? Is it effective? Is it, is it the best model that could be put in place? Because it seems to me that SPA actually don't have a lot of control over this. So, there's a number of you know, factors in, in all of that. That The model is complicated, as the, as the committee um, have heard in, in over many years, and indeed is subject to the, kind of, the recent considerations of um, the HMI, HMIS scrutiny report of 2019 and the work of the round table that the cabinet secretary is chairing. The spending, as you allude to, um, is almost entirely within Police Scotland and then subject to scrutiny and approval um, by the SPA and indeed with the accountable officer being the, uh, the chief executive of the SPA. There's been many uh, times that that has been subject to consideration as to whether this is an effective arrangement and it's still part, you know, it's actively part of the, the ongoing consideration of the round table. My inclination is to await the, the judgments that that round table makes uh, before uh, settling on whether that is subject to you know, wider review um, or change. But it's undoubtedly a factor, Mr Beattie, of the, the, com the complexity and the perception of imbalance between where the money is being spent and where it's being approved. Would you agree that unless that issue is addressed, then SPA's ability to achieve financial sustainability is going to be severely circumscribed? I'm, I think it's part of the story, but not entirely. I think what matters more, if I would say, is that there is progress around a workforce strategy 
that builds on the progress that we've seen in, in recent times with the, um, the production of the digital strategy, estate strategy and fleet strategy. All of these documents have to connect in the real world. <coughs> that there's, you know, it, as I say, it moves beyond the, just the two scenarios of cutting police numbers or increasing the budget. There has to be a rounded consideration of the requirements for policing. So I think it's both part of the story. Just a, just a final question there. Looking back uh, over the last two or three years, there's obviously been a great deal of issues around the police IT systems. And I'm not aware that they have budgeted for the necessary upgrades and replacements that are required in that respect. And I just wonder, do we still have a police force where lots of the different uh, units of it don't, are not able to speak to each other? Is there, a, is there a plan in there that you have seen to address this issue? I'll ask the, um, the team to come in in a, in a moment about that. Certainly, we've seen um, the digital data and ICT strategy, but quite ambitious uh, reforms, many of which had been years in the making. Uh, we know that part of that has been implemented, particularly through the mobile telephony progress. Um, so. Yes, there is improved communication um, that has brought policing you know, further forward. But whether all of that has been translated into the budget, much of that will depend on the revised medium-term financial strategy that will be considered uh, in the early part of 2021. But I'll ask uh, colleagues to come in in a moment, see if there's anything more that we can update on that point. Or Pauline Gillen, would you like to come in on those points? You don't have to if you don't have anything to add. but. Just no, I don't have anything else to add. Okay, Gillian Willman. Uh, the one thing I would just say is that we're conscious of the transformation strategy to do with digital data and IT, and it is uh, one of those areas where there's strategy in place, but the full funding for all of the ambitions continues to be part of the dialogue uh, to support the fulfilment of all of those areas. Thank you. I have a supplementary point from Graham Simpson. Thanks, convener. Orders to general. I just want to be clear on this. If you could just give me a, a maybe there isn't a simple answer to this, but you, you use the phrase in your report that the model of policing in Scotland is not financially sustainable. Can you summarise what it is about that model that makes it not financially sustainable? I'll do my best, Mr. Beatty. I think, uh, Mr. Simpson. I think we've seen repeatedly, year upon year, is um, either unplanned deficits, I think in the early part, a welcome transparency around the financial position in, in the past few years, which has clearly set out that in order for the policing service to deliver as intended under the direction of the Chief Constable, subject to the scrutiny by the, the Scottish Police Authority, that it plans to make deficits over and above the budget allocation. That leads us quite clearly to say, well, as it's currently designed in terms of how policing will be delivered, it's not going to be delivered within the confines of the budget made available to it um, by the Scottish Parliament. So the mechanics of that that underlie that, you know, whether it is as um, simple, albeit I know it's very complicated to cut police officer numbers, or whether it means to, to increase the budget. Our contention is that those are really the two options that have been presented, but we know it's much more complicated than that. And that's why we, you know, we've been calling for many years to say that in order to have a, a, a more rounded analysis, that one of the key missing planks needs to be a workforce strategy. With, and a workforce strategy is a complicated thing. It, you know, it has to be with the various scenarios are in policing numbers, the ratio of police officers to police staff, how ICT estates all interconnect. And that's with, without these then without all of these strategies, you cannot effectively say what the financial uh, sustainability requirements will be, and hence why the real urgency for these now to be produced. Would would it be fair to summarise then that if we want if we want to continue with the number of police officers that we have that Police Scotland needs more money? So I, I, I think ultimately that will be a matter for, for police and, and, and government to decide upon the number and, and the ratio. 
Um, what's been clear, though, from the numbers that have been reported this year and previous years is that sustaining the current model with those numbers against that budget will continue to produce overspends year after year. OK, thank you. Neil Bibby. Um, following on from that, um, the, thank you, Convener. Uh, following on from that, the report um, states that Police Scotland will need to implement, monitor and regularly review the workforce plan with appropriate scrutiny from uh, the SPA. Are you confident that Police Scotland and the SPA will be able to do this adequately and will you be monitoring their progress? And given you said we can expect the report in January, um, is this work being undertaken with the necessary pace, given the length of time it's taken for the SPA to produce a workforce plan? Um, so absolutely yes, we will be monitoring that really closely as part of our um, audit of the 2021 um, financial statements. Um, we welcome the, the confirmation of progress um, from the SPA and Chief Constable that this will be brought to the um, SPA board um, in January for its scrutiny uh, and then for consideration uh, by government. It will be a key part of our audit work next year. In, in, in you mentioned in the report in May 2018, the SBA approved a three-year financial um, a, a plan to achieve financial balance, and that plan was dependent on a reduction of police numbers by 750. And the cost of maintaining these officers in 2019 was 17 million. But obviously, we've heard about deficits and overspends in excess of 17 uh, million pounds. Now, obviously, that plan was put on hold, and there's this new workforce plan developing, and I appreciate what you're saying about looking at things in the round, yeah. but if there was no increased funding and all the cuts were to fall in police officer numbers, is that figure of 750 ballpark figure what we would still be looking at in terms of savings going forward to become financially sustainable, or could it be more or less? Um, the 750 number was a number that Police Scotland yeah. identified and said this is the number that, that they would target to reduce numbers to be uh, financially sustainable and that has featured an, a number of times um, in our own reporting um, and um, and by uh, the SPA Police Scotland as well. It, I think it feels like a variable number in truth and um, as we, and, and, and again I guess to go, to go back to um, what are the options, what are the, the alternatives and I think that to, for the workforce strategy to set out if it's not that number is there a difference in terms of um, police officer numbers, the ratio it'll have to, to police staff. One of the comments that we've heard from, um, or, or, or we know to be true rather, from uh, how policing, the nature of policing, the nature of crime, and the evolution of the workforce strategy of that crime is, is less likely to now happen on the street and more likely to be perpetrated in the home environment, and whether that necessitates a different skill mix all of these we would expect to be captured into uh, the updated workforce strategy. I should say, Mr Bibby, that um, we know that this work is progressing. We know it's been led by one of the Deputy Chief Constables. Um, so um, it's certainly, a, you know, we would expect it to be a rounded analysis when it's taken to the SPA board, but we'll closely track that and monitor that for our work next year. OK, thank you. OK, Alex Neil. Thank you, Convener. I want to pick up two themes with the Auditor General, just picking up on what Colin Beatty said about a lot of the expenditure by Police Scotland not really being under its own control. And I just wanted to clarify, obviously, a, a fair amount of work, particularly in recent times, that Police Scotland has had to undertake is as a result of referrals from the Crown Office. So when the Crown Office asks the police to carry out an investigation, whether it's justifiable or not, is there any um, requirement on the Crown Office uh, to transfer any of its resources uh, in terms of budget to Police Scotland, or does Police Scotland have to bear the entire burden of the call on its resources for undertaking what, in some cases, I think are spurious inquiries on behalf of the Crown Office. So I'll, I'll start, and I'll ask Gillian Woolman uh, to come in and supplement my comments. Gillian is also the auditor of, of the Crown Office, so she'll have an insight into that beyond my own understanding. Um, my assumption, Mr Neil, is no, there is no resource transfer that if the police intend to undertake uh, an investigation, they will do so through, through their own resources. But I can just I'll pause and, and invite Gillian to see if, if there's anything that she wishes to add. Gillian Woolman. Uh, thank you, Auditor 
Thank, thank you, Convener. Uh, yes, responding to the Auditor General's uh, point there, with respect to the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, they set their budget each year um, and in discussion and dialogue, obviously, with the Scottish Government, taking account of the volume of activity. During the year, there is no environment of budgets uh, dependent on activity levels uh, between the Police Scotland and the Crown Office. Uh, but as is, each year, budgets are subject to scrutiny dependent on each body's uh, relevant activity levels. And can I ask in a supplementary to that, Gillian, um, given, given particularly this year with COVID, given the very tight resources that Police Scotland is working towards to meet all its objectives, various people, um, does Police Scotland uh, have the power uh, when it, it receives an instruction from the Crown Office, which it might regard as not high priority, given everything else that's going on, does it still have to uh, follow those instructions to the Crown Office's timescale? Uh, can it say to the Crown Office, we, we don't have the resources to do that in the foreseeable future, or does it just simply have to carry out the Crown Office's instructions and go ahead, even if they might think that it's not a high priority in terms of the justice resources of the country and the police resources available to it? So, Mr Neil, as the appointed auditor for both the Crown Office and the Scottish Police Authority, the area that you describe there is beyond my remit uh, as the appointed auditor in those areas. That's very much to do with right. operational activity, as you describe it there. OK, maybe it's something we should write to the Chief Constable to ask what his leeway is, because um, clearly uh, when uh, resources are so tight and there's such a big job for Police Scotland to do, which in the whole it does extremely well, um, that um, perhaps these undue pressures are put on Police Scotland that might release some resources for higher priorities. Let me turn a convener to my second theme, and that's about the effectiveness and governance of the SPA itself. And I really get two questions for the Auditor General. First of all, can you tell us how much of the budget, um, the SPA budget, goes to the SPA per se, and how much of it ends up with Police Scotland? Uh, and secondly, uh, he quite rightly in his report um, makes a great deal of the stability and membership of the SPA, which has taken only eight years to achieve, but um, he doesn't mention the effectiveness or the governance arrangements. Can, they, can he comment on, on those points, please? Thank you, Mr Neil. And the effectiveness of the SPA. Thank you. Um, in, in terms of your first yeah. point, I, I may um, I may draw on colleagues actually just if they have the the ratio of of spend at, at their fingertips just to kind of set out the scale of the SPA spending relative to that of of Police Scotland. Um, though just before I before I do that for a moment, clearly the SPA spend um, is the a very minor proportion of the overall budget in that it incorporates largely governance led yeah. activity. But also importantly, I think under the SPA, um, also captures the cost of forensic services as well, which is a, a small but significant part of its activities. I'll just pause for a moment and invite uh, Pauline just to set out the kind of relative issue before I address your second point. Thank you. Yes, um, as the Auditor General said, the, the extent of expenditure um, by SPA is considerably smaller than that for, for Police Scotland. So just looking at the, the, the figures in the, the annual report and accounts, so for total expenditure of just over a billion pounds, only 3.6 million of it was allocated to SPA corporate services. So that just gives you an idea of the, the, the small scale of expenditure that's allocated to SPA. And, and effectiveness and governance. Yeah. Of thank you, thank you, Mr. Neil. I think um, we've seen, and, and there's been a number. We've uh, we've made comments ourselves, and, and other organisations have similarly made uh, assessments of the effectiveness of the governance arrangements within HMICS. It's also subject to um, the considerations of the cabinet secretary and stakeholder roundtable at the moment. I would point to, in particular, I think the HMICS. 
inspection report of uh, the SPA in September 2019. We set out you know, 14 recommendations, if I recall, on how best to improve its organisational effectiveness and aspects of its governance arrangements. From that, we've seen some signs of progress against those recommendations, particularly, we'd say, the revised corporate plan, um, a strategy for the SPA as an organisation, an organisational strategy, and that, that is beginning to be populated as welcome. We've also seen this year the production of our governance and accountability framework between the SPA and the Scottish Government, um, all of which are welcome, and similarly, uh, changes to some of its committee arrangements as well. I do know, and I know the, the committee um, has too, the, the very extensive report uh, recently published by Dame Elish Angelini, which also makes recommendations and judgments about the effectiveness of the SPA and that that's under active consideration by the Cabinet Secretary and the way forward and to be captured into the part of the work of the Roundtable and no doubt beyond too. I think our overall assessment, Mr Neil, is that there is signs of progress, but probably too early to be definitive that all the work that needs to be done um, has yet been done to achieve the stable platform, as it were, for how policing in Scotland will be delivered in the future. And as I say in my introductory remarks, it's one that we'll actively take stock and decide where best Audit Scotland's many additional audit work fits into any future considerations. Can I draw your attention to the letter sent to the Justice Secretary last week, published at the weekend, from the immediate past chair of the SPA, Professor Susan Deacon, in which she says she remains of the view there are fundamental flaws in many aspects of the current arrangements for governance and accountability. And she said the principle of an arm's length relationship between the police and the government need to be explored and developed further and that Police Scotland and its watchdog are, quote, joined at the hip. So um, can you give me, from the, the audit work done on the SPA, could you give me three examples from last year, the period of your work, where the intervention of the watchdog board, the SPA itself, materially impacted on decisions or processes within Police Scotland? So I, you referred to uh, Professor Deacon's um, response to the Cabinet Secretary. Yes, I've seen that too and, and, uh, and read Professor Deacon's comments and obviously I've listened carefully to the comments that she made to this committee uh, in February and her experiences of, of being the past chair of the SPA. Um, I think it's a really important intervention and welcome too. And, and, and uh, I think it's a sign that government and uh, SPA and policing in the round are listening to alternatives. I also note that the recommendations from, from Dame Eilish's report, um, extensive as they are, many of those will require potential changes in legislation, all of which will be considered, no doubt, as part of what the model may look like in future if it's subject to change. I would say in terms of uh, interventions, um, I'll, I'll maybe ask the team to come in in a moment, but I think one of... You know, this is not a perfect set of circumstances, Mr Neil, and I wouldn't want to, to portray it as such. One of the things that we, that we capture in the report is that um, we've talked about the, the financial sustainability challenges. We've talked about the absence of, of a workforce strategy. We also note that performance management arrangements are not as effective as they should be. In particular, um, we refer to the, the suite of information that the SPA should have at its disposal in order to discharge its scrutiny functions needs to be improved. It was, you know, progress was sought to be made a couple of years ago now, but it's only this summer that we've seen a revised indication of a performance management framework. So there's still much work to be done. In terms of interventions or effective scrutiny, one, perhaps I think one example I would give is in terms of the scrutiny of financial management arrangements. It's not that long ago that the SPA was presented with a single line budget for Police Scotland uh, to approve at, at the start of the year. Clearly a deficiency in arrangements. Um, but in terms of you know, the analysis that it now receives, the transparency of the financial management arrangements that it considers is a big step forward. Um, so that for me is, is signs of progress. 
Um, but I'll just check with uh, colleagues who are closer to some of the, the detail of the committee and, and the workings of the SPA authority, whether they've anything they wish to add. Gillian Woolman, Pauline Gillan. Thank you, convener. Um, Mr. Neil, I'd just like to assure you that through the annual audit process, we produce an interim report and a final report, both of which can contain recommendations each year. And I was just reflecting that our annual audit report on the 1920 audit documents our follow-up of last year's audit, where we made 11 recommendations. And we report back, and this comes into the public domain as, as this is published in due course, uh, all those areas where they have completed action against our recommendations and those areas which continue to be in progress. So an example of three areas there <clears throat> relate to the overall control environment for systems of uh, key control that relate to uh, the finance uh, function. So as the Auditor General says, we have seen strides, good strides being made about uh, the financial management arrangements. Uh, we also had recommendations in the past to do with the revisions and terms and, and reference of the committees. And we have reported on progress on that this year and also made additional recommendations at the end of this year. And um, an important area also relates to risk management arrangements internal to the Scottish Police Authority. And a lot of progress has been made uh, in the past 12 months in regard to that. So each year we do list recommendations and we do monitor progress against them. Yeah, I think, I think that's precisely my point, that any improvements have been the result of either recommendations from our committee or recommendations from yourself or from other bodies. What I want to know is the people who are on the board of the SPA, what added value, what creative activity, what level of scrutiny are they actually providing? And I've, not, I've seen no evidence of that whatsoever. I mean, we've just gone through nine months of COVID. We've had some high-profile prior, high, uh, police investigations, a number of which have been referred to by the Crown Office. Uh, and I've seen no evidence uh, whatsoever of the board actually asking policy issues that add value to the quality of the police service in Scotland. So my point is, it's, all these improvements are very welcome but they are a reaction to the likes of your predecessor as Auditor General, as well as this committee and others. Uh, when are we actually going to see the board um, do its own thing and do what it's set up to do? Its primary function is to uh, hold the police stop, and I don't see any evidence of that whatsoever. I'm going to let you answer, and then I'm going to move on. I think the conclusion that we reached in this uh, report, convener, um, and one largely mirrored, I think, for some of the, the other recent reports as well, is that there are signs of stability, um, certainly in the leadership of Police Scotland, but also in the Scottish Police Authority too. We would point to um, the role played by the interim chair and also by the interim uh, accountable officer, both of which have brought stability uh, to the organisation. There is still work to do, and Mr Neil is correct, and we make similar judgments ourselves. We note that there are some work that can be done, just in general arrangements, within the Scottish Police Authority and its governance uh, setup. The committee may recall that we, we previously expressed reservations about what we call blurred lines of responsibility between executive and non-executive activity within the Police Authority. Uh, we are seeing less of that. I think it's signs of progress in the executive leadership um, under the interim accountable officer and her plans to populate uh, much of which has already been undertaken, a more effective SPA structure, a more effective organisation um, in its own right. Some things still to happen, Mr Neil, undoubtedly. Um, the volume of papers that are considered um, by its committees is too high. The length and duration of meetings is too high, much of which was covered uh, in the work undertaken by another former Auditor General, Robert Black, in his report uh, during the summer. And indeed, progress to be made in terms of the, di the diversity of the board that it represents all of Scotland's people. So work undoubtedly is still to be done, but I think what we are seeing this year is signs of progress, both in terms of the work of the authority and its executive. Graeme Simpson. Thank you. Thanks, convener. I mean, it's all, it, it really is all very frustrating to hear this. I mean, 
Uh, and Colin Beatty uh, must be tearing his hair out, what's left of it. I mean, he, 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 he turns up every meeting uh, and says he's heard the same thing over and over again, and that's what we're hearing today. Um, can I turn to another area, uh, and it's the area in your report uh, titled Transformation, paragraph 12. Uh, we've already spoken about a workforce strategy, but there are a number of other strategies, digital data and ICT, estates and fleet. Uh, and they all appear, according to you in your report, Auditor General, to rely on extra funding. Um, and you make the point that that's unusual uh, in the public sector, that normally people are expected to produce strategies that you know, live within an existing budget, but that's not the case here. Why, why is that? So, so you're right, Mr Simpson. We do make the point in the report that um, ordinarily transformation within public bodies tends to happen within the confines uh, of existing budget arrangements. Um, given the scale of um, reform of policing, you know, I think as has been noted by a number of commentators, perhaps the most significant piece of public sector reform that's taken place um, within the uh, duration of the Scottish Parliament. Um, part of the, the recognition was that there would need to be some additional funding to support transformation. Uh, Sizeable reform budgets were created and, and, su and supported the uh, revenue and capital position um, of police funding. We have, we have seen and we welcome the, the progress that's been made with the creation of the digital data ICT strategies, all of which are necessary components of their um, organisational thinking. We mentioned a number of times this morning the, the importance of that that's complemented by a, a workforce strategy too. The, all of these components have to connect so that there's a coherent um, financial plan. Effectively, it says, how can we best deliver policing um, in Scotland? that's not just dependent on and you know, those two scenarios that we've talked about already of increasing the budget or reducing um, office or numbers. They all have to be in place. And as we say in the report, a number of places that you know, it has been pressing. Um, it's now you know, eight years since the creation of Police Scotland um, and the pressing need and urgency to get these components in place. OK, um, I mean, do the do Police Scotland and the SPA accept your conclusion in that same paragraph that they need to urgently review their strategies. Have you spoken to them about it? So um, it, it may be a, a line of questioning that the committee wish to explore in more detail you know, with the SPA and, and Police Scotland. In terms of our own arrangements, so we have, um, as we do with all of our reports, we clear um, the reports for, for accuracy and, and comment um, with the SPA. So. Um, this is our judgment effect. This is you know, what we say needs to, to ha now happen in order to get a sustainable financial model for policing. Okay. Thank you. Gail Ross. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Auditor General, and um, thanks for coming back to our meeting. Also to uh, Pauline and Gillian, I want to touch on the performance framework. Your report states that it did not deliver the expected improvements in performance reporting. So are you able to expand on um, to the extent which the framework did not deliver? And can you also tell us, um, are you aware of any of the reasons why the data was not available um, as you were needing? Good morning. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll start and I'll invite Pauline Gillen um, to come in and say a bit more in, uh, in a moment or two. Um, there's a bit of a history of this, about, and, and, it, and it absolutely matters that in order for the SPA to discharge its scrutiny functions properly, it has to be in receipt of high quality data, high uh, quality analysis. What we've seen through, through our audit work is much of that data um, historically has come directly um, from Police Scotland and, and its own uh, systems. And therefore, you know, there was a, a proper recognition that in order for the SPA to you know, do its uh, role more roundedly, that is, it should be drawn on a, on a wider range of sources and activity. Um, it's good that that is now captured in its corporate strategy and its performance um, and its organisational um, uh, corporate strategy, but it's not there yet. Um, 
the plans to implement the strategy a couple of years ago didn't deliver um, as intended, and we now have a new strategy from uh, from June of this year. Um, I'll, get, I'll hand over to Pauline, uh, Ms Ross, just to say a bit more detail about some of the steps that didn't transpire as intended, though. Pauline Gillan. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, in, in April 2019, uh, a revised performance reporting framework was introduced, which had a more outcome-focused approach. And I think, I think perhaps this may answer um, one of the illustrative examples that Mr Neil asked for earlier. So during the year, the authority members who sit on the Policing Performance Committee, who are responsible for scrutinising um, policing performance, they identified a number of areas of improvement um, that, could, that could be addressed in the, the, current, the current framework. These included things like just improving the clarity and the style of presentation to make it clearer what, what performance progress had been made during the year, and also to have a better balance between quantitative and qualitative data. So, as a result of that feedback, the performance framework was revised again and was approved by the authority in June 2020. So, the 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 um, the report, there'll be a quarterly report that goes to the performance policing performance committee every quarter before it then goes on to the authority. So, there's scrutiny scrutiny of the revised framework taking place, and the as the auditor general said, the <clears throat> the plan is that the, the quarterly performance report has a more detailed picture using a wider range of performance measures and additional evidence, including things such as benchmarking. Okay, thank you. Um, the report also states um, that it's vital that there are robust performance managements in place so that we can... Sorry, that was a dog. Um, so that we can measure progress with implementation of this new strategy. So, from what you've observed so far, and I know that you know we're only a, a few months into it, but are you confident now that these uh, new arrangements are actually going to make a difference? I, I think it's too soon to to see, Ms. Ross. I think it's certainly part of our audit work during um, the current audit year, uh, and we'll continue to track uh, and monitor that. As well as our, as the, the judgments we will make as the, the auditors, um, there's a real onus for the Scottish Police Authority themselves to be satisfied for their members to have their voice heard about the adequacy of the, these arrangements. Um, and it's something that we'll continue to track and, and report back to the committee as necessary. Um, and just a, a final um, point, uh, and this is probably far too soon as well, um, considering it was only a couple of months ago, but there has been a first report made under the new framework that was in September 2020. Have you had a chance to review that yet, or will that form part of your future work? I'll, I'll ask Pauline to come in and comment about you know, the judgments she's making about the the recent reporting, whether that um, marks a, a, the kind of step change improvement that we've been calling for. Pauline Gillan. Yes, I think it does. It's, it's, it's much better aligned to how, how the authority plans to achieve its strategic priorities. Um, at, the, at the authority board meeting, there was positive feedback from members, and they felt as if they, this was a, an important um, step towards improvement. And as the Auditor General said, as, as the year goes on, we will continue to monitor reporting to the authority and to the Policing Performance Committee. Thank you. Thanks, Convener. Thank you, Gail Ross. I'm going to bring in Liam Kerr, please. Thank you, convener, and uh, I'm very grateful to the committee for allowing me to attend this morning and to the Auditor General and the team for indulging me. Um, I just have two questions, Auditor General, if I may, I, which rather wrap up some of the themes we've been exploring this morning. It, it, it seems to me that, I, from my previous work with this committee, that every year the, the uh, the Auditor General comes back and says, look, the Scot Scottish Government is having to make up a fairly significant shortfall. It, it begs the question, at what point does the Scottish Government have to accept it is not budgeting properly for policing in Scotland? And, and actually, going forward, it should work on the basis that the budget plus the bailout is a more realistic funding floor going forward. 
Was your question directed to the Auditor General, Liam Kerr? Yes, please. Auditor General. Good morning, Mr Kerr. Um, I think I heard the Cabinet Secretary in, in the Chamber um, respond that the financial position of and the funding available to the Police Service of Scotland through the SPA will be considered as part of the Government's uh, consideration um, of the 21-22 budget uh, proposals. Um, but fundamentally, you know, we've seen, um, and as the committee have seen you yourself in, in, in recent members of the committee, that um, it's not a sustainable position that's currently presented. I think we would contend, and I think we've kind of touched on a couple of points this morning, that um, th that rounded analysis of the workforce, and as we, as we captured in the report, that 85% um, of costs of Police Scotland are through its workforce that the missing gap in the analysis that allows to say, well, is it as simple as just increasing the budget um, or the alternative that was presented of reducing police numbers it needs to have a more rounded analysis that's built upon a strategic workforce plan and how that connects with the impact that technology will have and how policing is delivered, what its estates needs will be um, and what its fleet requirements will be. All of these are key components that we say that go beyond just those two quite stark scenarios of increasing the base budget or reducing numbers. We think it's more complicated than is uh, being presented. Uh, uh, thank you for that answer. I mean, that will take time, no doubt. Uh, and it, it, as you say, uh, paragraph 10 of your report, you say the deficit will increase without additional funding or workforce cuts. So again, given that th th there will presumably be a time gap before being in a position to make that call, which do you consider is the most likely to happen? And if that is workforce cuts, is that really an option given that next year's pressures on police, given things like the, the ongoing pandemic, the COP26, Brexit, the elections, uh, pressure on the police is only going to increase next year, isn't it? I, I recall um, I think the Chief Constable's comments, and I think partly you know, for all those factors that you outlined that it was agreed between um, the SPA, Police Scotland and the Scottish Government that the reduction of the presented 750 officer numbers wasn't the right time in light of pre-pandemic for the, um, the UK's withdrawal from the European Union, the, what had been the upcoming COP26 summit in Glasgow, the presence of the, the pandemic, um, the current year, all of which were factors that that wasn't the appropriate time to, to reduce officer numbers. I think the Chief Constable has also commented that um, any reduction in, in officer numbers wouldn't happen in a single year anyway. This would be a phased approach. So clearly there's a discussion then required about what this all means for the budget for policing in Scotland uh, for the 21-22 uh, financial year. Um, and you're right, it's not something that's going to be resolved in, in one financial year. Uh, it's taken a long time to get to this point. Um, I am optimistic of what will come through in the analysis um, of workforce, and I, and I don't mean to labour the point, but I think it now feels such an important component of having a rounded picture with the accompanying scenarios of, of what policing might look like um, into the future. Very grateful. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Kerr. Do members have any further questions or points for the Auditor General and his team? Okay, can I thank you all, Stephen Boyle, Gillian Woolman and Pauline Gillan, very much for your evidence this morning. I now close the public session of this meeting as we move into private. Thank you. <laughs>